All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our presentation today. We're very excited to have Michael Provo with us, who has a background in heritage tourism, and he'll be presenting on heritage tourism and the New Hampshire Scenic Byways. So we're very excited to hear from him. If you could please go ahead and mute yourselves throughout the presentation, you're welcome to uh, ask any questions that you'd like through the chat during the presentation, and then he'll take questions via chat or if you'd like to unmute at the very end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael. Thank you, and thank, thank you, you for having me today. It's uh, exciting. I was at the first governor's conference on travel and tourism where the Granite State Ambassadors were introduced. So um, I've always followed and appreciated the work that they do. Uh, I'm going not going to really answer questions till the end, um, just because of that way there we don't interrupt things. And I will try to identify what pictures it is that I'm showing so you don't spend the morning going, now what was that picture as? I know I've seen that somewhere. Um, because some of them have stories that go. Uh, my background basically, uh, originally I spent like 20 years in the hospitality industry. Uh, and my wife and I formerly owned Rockingham Ballroom in Newmarket, New Hampshire. And when we left the ballroom, I went back to school and I ended up working with the New Hampshire Main Street programs and working on revitalizing downtowns in four communities in New Hampshire. Always enjoyed history, so therefore um, heritage tourism just fit right in there and it allowed me to do things that I love. So the top picture that you see is actually a program from the National Trust from Historic Preservation. Every year they do um, an awareness program called This Place Matters. And these are volunteers from the spring cleanup we did in Rochester, New Hampshire, when we were bringing attention to Central Square and the statue of Parson, Maine, and the fact that it was very dilapidated and needed work. Um, the result of this picture and the awareness created, we got a lot of grants and we were able to totally redo the stair and re re redo the square and repatinate the statue. Um, and basically it tells the history because he is was the first minister and founding minister for the city of Rochester. Uh, the bottom picture of course is a great view from the Kankamagus Highway from one of their pull-offs. And as we go through, I'm going to try to explain what heritage tourism is, um, how it fits in, different levels of it, and also talk about at the end the New Hampshire Scenic Byways program and give you information on how they were founded and what the symbiotic relationship is between the two. So to begin with, uh, the National Scenic Byway program was founded in 1991 through the Federal Intermodal Surface Transportation Equity Act, more popularly known as ICE-T. Um, and it established the Scenic Byway Program and the criteria for it at that time. Uh, and a National Scenic Byway is a road that's recognized by the United States Department of Transportation for one or more of six intrinsic qualities. Uh, archaeological resources, cultural resources, their historic resources, natural resources, recreational resources, and scenic resources. Now, it doesn't have to be just one of the six. Most scenic byways <coughs> are combinations of all of these. Uh, the program was established by Congress in 1991 to preserve and protect the nation's scenic, but often less traveled roads and to promote tourism and economic development. The National Scenic Byways Program is administered by the Federal Transportation, Federal Highway Transportation Administration. Um, the unfortunate thing with the Scenic Byways is that it was a timed 
um, act with ice tea, which ran out. And when it ran out in 2012, funding for the program also ran out. So scenic byways that have been enacted since 2012, originally <clears throat> there was money attached to the de designation for visitor centers and signage and wayfinding and websites and marketing. And that all went away in 2012 um, when they did the uh, modified active project for century 21. And uh, that sort of replaced ice tea, but it took away the funding for the scenic byway program. Most of the scenic byways in New Hampshire have been um, formed and developed, applied and designated by the regional planning commissions. And that's the starting basis. And um, so many of them have not been established before the 2012 so they don't have the opportunity of the funding. So to go into heritage tourism, uh, for the definition, the word heritage is derived from the French word l'hérité, which is what we receive from our ancestors community, communally. Um, that is our culture, our traditions, our history and things like that, our way of life. Uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation defines heritage tourism is traveling to experience the places, artifacts, and activities that authentically represent the stories of people of the past and present. It includes cultural, historic, and natural resources. Basically, a heritage tourist is looking for unique travel experiences. And I know your training as a Granite State Ambassador, you're also asking questions when they ask you, where can we go to do, or what is there to do? You ask them questions as to what are their interests. So basically it's that idea, you're matching that learning and yearning for culture with what it is they're interested in. Um, Tourism in New Hampshire um, is New Hampshire's second largest industry. The first is banking. Third is manufacturing. The economic impact of tourism is over $5 billion annually to the state of New Hampshire. Uh, the last time they actually did the complete study, tourism supported 68,000 jobs in the state of New Hampshire. Um, that means that the money that comes in supported 68,000 payrolls. Um, visitations increase exponentially every year. That's always been the trend, depending on the New Hampshire Office of Travel and Tourism Promotion and how they promote the state. Um, there are years when it has gone down because we have one of the largest legislative bodies in, in, in the world. Uh, and sometimes they decide that they need to save money and they don't understand the relationship between the travel and promotion and the travelers coming into the state. So therefore they decide to cut the budget. Um, however, tourism is essential to the New Hampshire economy because that economic impact of $5 billion uh, 8% New Hampshire room and meals tax funds a lot of programs within the state. So if they don't do the promotion and they don't get the visitors in, then they'll see a dip in the room and meals tax incomes. Um, and the room and meals tax is interesting because it was originally set up to um, take advantage and expected that mainly visitors and tourists in the state of New Hampshire would be paying the bulk share of that total tax that was coming into the state. Uh, residents would have to pick it up if they went out to eat or things like that. Um, but basically it was geared towards visitors, hotel rentals and things like that. So, And the house on the right that you see is actually New Hampshire's original um, governor's mansion. Uh, it's the Wentworth 
Gardner Mansion down in Portsmouth and uh, Coolidge rather. And it uh, was the seat of the New Hampshire Governor's Council and New Hampshire's first royal governors. Uh, it's a great place to visit. Heritage tourism activities. Uh, why is heritage tourism important in rural communities? Because it helps provide funding to preserve and maintain cultural and historical resources. Um, it brings people in to help pay at events, fundraise for organizations that are taking care of these resources. It also helps to promote and educate people as to what our resources are and our way of life here. It helps to provide jobs with the income. It also increases retail activity. Uh, heritage tourists, tourists tend to like value added products, uh, which means they like to buy something that when they bring home, they can say this jug of maple syrup we got on our recent trip to New Hampshire. We went to a sugar shack. So there's a whole story with it. That's known as a value added product. It promotes partnerships um, because in order to do heritage tourism activities like old home days or festivals or cultural activities, it usually involves multiple organizations and so it helps build communities. And in that way, it strengthens the community by building those relationships. Uh, the picture on the right is an annual Polish dinner that's done in Newmarket by the senior citizens every year. And anyone can attend as long as you buy the tickets in advance. Uh, domestic heritage tourism uh, has been studied and the results are that a heritage tourist that's looking for that unique travel experience tends to stay longer, 5.2 versus 3.4 nights when they reach a destination. Uh, they look to engage in and learn about the community that they're in and the area they're in. Again, it's that purchase of value added products um, where they uh, buy books about where they're visiting, not just a guidebook or a picture book, but history books and things like that. The maple syrup, the homemade jams and jellies, the hand knit sweaters. Um, out of the approximately 146.4 million uh, domestic travelers that were um, annually interviewed and subjects of the study, 81% uh, cited that they were interested in heritage tourism activities. Um, heritage tourists tend to spend more um, on a daily basis or a two-day basis or whatever. The average is $623 per day versus $457 per day. Um, 35 million of those visitors that were surveyed indicated that art culture or history were one of the main reasons for their travel. Um, and this was done in a 2006 study. Um, it's up 13% since 1996. Uh, and heritage tourism is one of the fastest and longest rising modes of uh, reasons for travel. Um, international heritage tourism, 78% uh, of U.S. visitors had cited that they were visiting the U.S. because they were interested in the culture, the history, and, and uh, natural resources. 15.4 uh, million, 68% of the visitors um, were classified as heritage tourists. 8% uh, of those visitors visit New England. We don't get a big chunk of the visitation on uh, international travel. Um, that's why the, the Discover New England um, group is there to help promote New England international travel because the states really don't have the wherewithal to promote internationally. They're doing much better with it now though. 41% visited, who visited, uh, went to an art gallery or museum. 
29% uh, cited visiting concerts, plays, and music. 41% went to cultural or ethnic sites or events. 68% uh, visited historical places. 37% or about or more than one third visited small towns, uh, which is really close to why scenic byways programs are great for heritage tourism because that 35% would be the ones most likely to be in small towns. Uh, the state most visited in the United States for international heritage tourism is New York City with 45.5% of people responding. So let's talk about New Hampshire small towns and heritage tourism. You know, there's sort of a then and a now kind of thing. We're talking like 20 years ago to now. You know, then people had planned cultural experiences. Now people look for local immersion. They want to be part of it. Uh, they can dive right into local events and experiences. Um, you can help them with calendars and explanations of the local experiences and what's out there and find out who has immersive and interesting hands-on activities and promote them when you're meeting with um, with travelers. Uh, then a lot of travelers were just, they'd come with a list and they were checking off sites and scenes and things that they wanted to do on their list. Now you'll find a lot of travelers that are looking for new sites, different things. They wanna be able to talk about the different things they did that were off the beaten path when they went on their um, travels. And small towns specialize in being off the beaten path. So, you know, what can you discover in a small town? Uh, what are the little known assets and the things that you would take a friend to if they came into your community, whether it's the local farmer's market or the museum or the old home day or things like that. Um, then, you know, the big thing, you visit museum and you visit monuments. You know, now they're also interested in visit local artists and artisans and small towns have tons of those. And usually they're much more accessible. They work in their studio. They have little stores in their studio. Uh, they're willing to talk to people and show people. They're much more friendly and open. And uh, there are more artist visit options within tourism now. Uh, then it was you ate the typical tourist fair, whether it was going to Golden Corral or whatever. Uh, now you'll find that travelers really want to look where the residents go and find the hidden gems. All of our eateries are hidden gems in small towns. And if you talk about the local eateries and give the local view of what tastes good. And, you know, I've always been a big believer in don't worry about the change because they have the marketing companies and everything else. But let's push what's special in the downtowns. And, um, and that's very important. Uh, then a lot of people use guidebooks. Uh, now it's words of mouth, listening to friends and fellow travelers, which is really good advice. Uh, thinking of your tourism info as you're talking to friends and fellow travelers. Um, and I'm sure this is old stuff to a lot of Granite State ambassadors, but never hurts to talk about it more. Um, then 80% of travelers cited culture as a top motivator in 2009. That dropped to 69% in 2013. Uh, and there's really something interesting about culture, history, things like that. There was a study that was done that um, they asked the people surveyed to name um, a historic Main Street. And, you know, so there were things, of course, like the Castro in San Francisco, Broadway. But number three on the list was uh, Main Street in Disneyland, believe it or not, um, which meant that, you know, the, the travelers now are getting much more um, informed. But Main Street Disneyland is not a historic Main Street. Um, so now we're talking the small towns are the perfect place to learn, explore, and experiment because that's the real thing. Um, it's not something that's built. It's not an attraction. 
Um, and it, there's lots more to explore with different shops, unique boutiques, and discovery uh, to the tourism visit. And, uh, you know, I always think, you know, how else can small towns adjust their tourism to tap into changing motivations of travelers uh, when I was working in communities? And uh, this is a quote from a friend of mine that had a bed and breakfast that uh, when we were talking about heritage tourism, that said, when my friends come to visit me, they don't want to see museums all the time. They want to meet Macau's. So Dick Rodemeyer, meet Daisy. Um, and basically that sort of sums up that experience and that immersion that people are looking for. I mean, the look on his face says it all. He's just loving, you know, I'm not sure the cow likes it, but uh, that's probably an experience he'd go home and talk about. Uh, where do heritage tourism, court tourists get their information? Uh, these are the top four. And uh, it was, it's not, doesn't add up to 100. It's not broken up that way. It's what the top four places were that people found their information. 48% were their computer and their phone. And that was at the beginning of the iPhones and stuff. So I'm sure it's even higher now. 36% uh, were through a travel agency, but we've all seen travel agency for as an information resource uh, drop with studies go on. 24% uh, were through the airlines, through the posters that they see in the airports and the magazines that they saw, you know, while they were on the plane and also booking through flights and things like that. 19% uh, or 20% got it from friends or relatives, speaking with friends or relatives that had traveled to that area before. And there are five tenets for heritage tourism. Uh, the photo here is basically the Rotary Arts Pavilion in Dover, which draws people from all over every Friday during the summer, and they have lunchtime concerts and everything else. Um, the benefits should be shared by the community and the visitor. Um, in other words, the community should be able to enjoy what's going on for the activity, but also the visitor needs to be able to enjoy it. It needs to be authentic. It, it's not a Disneyland. It's not a little Switzerland of America. It's community doing what the community is and being the community. It needs to, needs to be diverse because it needs to be welcoming to all. Uh, it needs to be quality. It, it's not something that you, you know, it's not like let's go to Sandwich and put on a Wild West show. It's not that kind of thing. Uh, and the cost should be shared equally between those that are attending the event and the community or the organization that's hosting the event. Meaning that it shouldn't be a total burden to the community to put on an event um, and it shouldn't be a total burden on the visitor to pay for the entire event. Um, and that's sort of uh, what's taught when, they're, when you're looking at uh, putting together heritage tourism activities. And let's not forget the local heritage tourists. Um, you know, those people that are taking day trips or overnights that are from, you know, one state over or two states down, they're quick. Um, Baby boomers tend to be the uh, biggest group, uh, those born between 1945 and 64. However, increasingly as our population ages, we're seeing the yuppies, the Gen X, millennials, and all of them uh, more, more often. Um, they tend to take uh, a little bit longer trips than day trips. Uh, they'll go a little further because we're a more mobile society. Um, day or overnight trips. They like themed or educational things um, if they're going. And this is really big because they tend to be a lot of multi-generational ones now. Um, today, we don't have the standard family. You have grandparents traveling with grandchildren or aunts and uncles taking nieces and nephews. You know, not everybody has the 2.5 kids and goes with them all the time. Um, so basically, it's it's a mixed bag. Um, 
They spend an average of $2,995 a year per person on traveling. And they take an average of 4.2 of these trips per year. Um, so it's not just a person that comes from California or can be somebody that comes up from Boston for the day. Heritage activity examples. Um, the picture on the left, for those who don't recognize it, is Fort Constitution. Um, it is uh, available pretty much from dusk, from dawn till dusk. It's free. It's located off Route uh, 1B in Newcastle. Um, it was the site of the first shots of the American Revolution. Everyone thinks Concord and Lexington were the first shots. First shots here were December 14th in 1774. Uh, the reason that it's not considered the first shots fired is because the colonists didn't return fire because the height of the um, fort in the embrasure didn't allow them to shoot down into the crowds that were attacking the forts for the powder raid. So when the shots were fired, they were fired over the heads and the same with the cannons. But that's where they removed the powder um, and stole the arms out of the powder house at the fort and they stored them in the meeting houses. It's a great multi-generational thing. Kids love it. Once you go inside, there's interpretive signage. Um, and kids can climb up, they can go through the embrasures and things like that. Um, you can see the Civil War Fort on the end. Um, it's free and it's a great day trip. The one on the right is, um, was Dover Main Street each year does a reveal, which is a historic reveal. And this one was called Factory on Fire. And in working with heritage tourism and communities, I always get, um, well, nothing ever happened here. And my suggestion is for them to start reading the old newspapers in their community and they'll find out about things that did happen in their community. Um, this group of people was a cast of 135 that enacted factory on fire. And basically in 1907, the mill behind them caught fire and burned. There were three people killed. Uh, the result was it was the first time in the state of New Hampshire that an employee sued an employer for injuries sustained on the job and won. Um, so basically they put together 27 different vignette scenes. Um, they charged money for the tour, it was guided and uh, it raised over um, $15,000 that year for the local organization by sharing the history. And people came from all over for this. They also do one called the Cemetery Revealed. Locally, it can be very small heritage activities. Uh, the photo on the left is a bootlegger murder mystery that was done for a traveling tour group at a local uh, inn in the dining room with their dinner. And it was just a local theater group who put together um, a bootlegger murder mystery that told the history of bootlegging in their community. The one on the right is yours truly. I practice what I preach. Um, each year I do a guided mystery tour uh, in my community called Murder, Mischief, Mishaps, and Mayhem, Tales of Old Newmarket. And it just tells the stories of all the plagues and the disasters and the murders and all of the weird stuff that went on in town. And uh, it's like $10, but I have people that come from all over and they're sold out every year. Unfortunately, due to COVID last, the last two years, I haven't been able to do it, but um, I donate all the funds to um, organizations within the community, it changes from year to year. And then you have community fairs and events. For those of you who don't know and have never been there, this is the Great Pumpkin Regatta in Goffstown, which happens every fall. And they take giant pumpkins. Yeah, I knew Robbie was going to chime in on that one. 
Um, if you haven't been, go. It's been going on for like 25 years now, Ravi, isn't it? Should be close. Uh, first one was in 2000, so 22 years. There we go. I, I knew we were close. Um, but it's a lot of fun. Um, they hollow out the big pumpkins. They put flotation collars on them. Uh, they float around the river and then underneath the bridge out comes the great pumpkin with a water cannon and chases them all around. Um, but the restaurants come out, the local organizations come out. Um, I had a great dessert pizza there, an apple pizza that I still remember, and that was probably 20 years ago. Um, but it's a great time. And those are the kind of things that people are uh, looking for. Um, to experience when they're coming in their heritage tourists. So let's go to the National Scenic Byway Program. Uh, the National Scenic Byway Program, like I said, was started by the ICE-D program. And there are actually four different levels in the Scenic Byway Program. There are nationally designated scenic byways then the creme de la creme of scenic byways are all American roadways. And those are nominated locally. Those would be things, the national scenic byways are like Route 66, uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway, things like that. Uh, all American roadways are the creme de la creme. They meet like all six criteria and uh, they are nominated by the individual states. Then there are scenic byway corridors. Um, and those are corridors, uh, those are byways that are linked together by commonality of communities or events or actual natural resources landscape. Uh, those are also nominated by local states. Uh, scenic roads are not part of the scenic byway program. Scenic roads are local designations by towns or communities, and some of you may have scenic roads. But if you're looking at the total picture in New Hampshire, there are 53 uh, altogether local scenic roads, scenic byway corridors, and all American roadways. Um, at this point in time, we do not have a nationally designated scenic byway. Um, this is actually a map uh, which you can get from the New Hampshire Department of Transportation that lists the official scenic byways uh, as they stand right now in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, I think there's like 22 and three great American roadways, all American roadways. Um, there's the American Independence Byway, which is in the Exeter area. Um, and this information is all available on the New Hampshire Department of Transportation websites. You just hit Scenic Byways Program. Uh, there's the Apple Byway, kind of says what it's uh, all about is apple orchards and things like that. The Branch River Valley Scenic Byway. Uh, the Coastal Byway, which is Route 1A and 1B through Newcastle and then down along the coast of New Hampshire. Uh, the Connecticut River Byway, which follows the Connecticut River down the borderline of the state, um, is basically considered an all-American road and has been designated that. Uh, Courier and Ives Trail, the Enfield Shaker Village Byway, the General John Stark Byway. The Kankamagus Highway is an all-American road designation. Uh, Lake Sunapee Scenic and Cultural Byway. Um, the Lakes region has a tour which goes completely around Winnipesaukee and some of the other lakes. Uh, and that's considered a scenic byway. Uh, the Mill Scenic Byway connects uh, between Newmarket, Durham, Madbury, Dover, and into Rawlinsford and connects our early water powered mills. Um, the Moose Path Trail. There's the Mountain Road Scenic Byway, the Old Stagecoach Scenic Byway, which is partnered with the Robert Frost Scenic Byway, uh, Presidential Range Trail, River Heritage Trail, 
the upper Lamprey Scenic Byway, which is like Deerfield, Candia, Auburn, and uh, Nottingham Northwood. Uh, the White Mountain Trail, which is an all-American road, and the Woodland Heritage Trail. And signage. Um, there are very few, the, the only two that I know that have their own distinctive signage at this point that are New Hampshire scenic byways are Robert Frost and the Old Stagecoach Byway. Um, there is an availability of the sign on the right that says scenic and cultural byways. Um, however, those have to be paid for by the individual communities and byways since the funding is gone. And you go through the state to get that signage. It's important to note though, that the signage is not wayfinding signage. It doesn't point out points of interest. It doesn't point out where to turn or things like that. It just says this road is part of a scenic and cultural byway. And uh, you can get information on the scenic byways uh, by Googling the individual byways that are on the list. Uh, some of the sites, they have websites that are very detailed and they list events and everything else on them. Other ones just have a space page or whatever. Um, and sometimes you have to go through the local uh, Regional Planning Commission in order to get information on that byway, depending on the area of the state it's in. So of course, the uh, photos here are the Robert Frost uh, homestead from the Robert Frost byway. The other one is from the uh, town hall, I think it's in Atkinson or something like that, or Atkinson or Chester from the uh, Stagecoach Scenic Byway. The other one on the top is the Mill Agent's House in Newmarket from the Mills Byway. The uh, photo in the bottom left is the John Stark Scenic Byway reenactment. And notice the uh, daffodils around the monument. Uh, the interesting thing is some of these byways have done community things. And on the John Stark, they have planted thousands upon thousands of daffodils along the roadside and town squares and stuff. So if you're taking that byway in the spring, uh, you'll just see lots and lots of daffodils. And the bottom right photo is the American Independence Museum in Exeter, which of course is where they read the Declaration of Independence. And it actually housed one of the Dunlop broadsides um, of printing of the American uh, Declaration of Independence. So how do you get more information? Um, www.newhampshire.gov DOT Scenic Byways will take you to the site where you could print off the map. Um, it doesn't allow you to, uh, I had to actually print it off and take a picture of it because they don't allow you to take it down off there. And uh, it gives you listings and background information on all the scenic byways. Um, the other thing that's a great tool, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it, is www.visitnewhampshire.gov events calendar. Um, most fairs, events, festivals, tours, classes, farmers markets, all of those kind of things, they're all going to be listed on that. So, you know, if you're going to be someplace where you're hosting for a day, it's always a good idea to go on and see, okay, what's going on around the state for that day. Um, there are also 10 New Hampshire Regional Planning Commissions that are responsible for nominating all of these individual byways. And you can also try Googling the individual byways by name. Um, and some of them have maps, some of them have directions. Some of them have, you know, when they become a scenic byway, they have to list all of their resources. So a lot of them have that list available and it will tell you what you can see taking that byway. So for me, that's it, except I always love this slide. Uh, 
if you if you don't get the humor of it, listen to our local New Hampshire comedian Justin McKinney, who has a wonderful program on New Hampshire being the only state that puts liquor stores on their highways. So, um, so I will uh, stop my sharing of the screen, and I'm happy to take any questions that anyone may have now. And thank you for listening today. Thank you so much, Michael. We, uh, you can unmute to ask a question or you can share something in the chat. We've had a few comments come through about some of the byways and some of the different events too. So that's great. Does anybody have any questions? Hello. So thank you, Michael. Um, for those of you who have never met him before, Michael's a, um, he is one of the first of the New Hampshire Main Street directors. He's, he's done a marvelous job in all the communities he's touched. And so if you've been to Jaffrey or Dover or Rochester, you, you've taken advantage of some of the great work he's done, including in his hometown of Newmarket. But I wanna really say this, the scenic byways are great resources for people who are looking to travel um, and and get that that local flavor and our scenic byway in, in, that runs Gosstown, Dunbarton, New Boston and Ware do come in the spring. It it is simply gorgeous with all the daffodils. Thanks so much, Robbie. Uh, Violet, you have a question? Yeah. Are the scenic byways do they indicate whether or not they're bicycle friendly? They do not, <laughs> um, which is, I know a lot of people do biking now. I know on the Mill Scenic Byway, you can easily get, there is a, it's not a bike lane, but it is a travel lane that's six feet wide that goes, starts in Newmarket, goes through Durham and goes all the way into Dover. So a good part of that road is. Um, a lot of the communities now with scenic roads, though, are using what they call the Shero symbols. And I don't know if you've noticed them there, right in the pavement, they have, they're like two chevrons, one above the other, and then underneath it's got a bicycle. And that means it's an international symbol that says share the road, which means those are supposed to be bicycle friendly roads. And people driving those roads are aware if there is an accident on a road with Shero symbols, you don't want to be the one who ignored them and struck a bicyclist because the courts will love to see you in their courtroom. Thank you. And those Shero symbols are becoming more and more popular in communities, especially on the seacoast here. All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, we will uh, thank you very much, Michael. Did somebody say something? Hey, thank you for having me today. Okay. <laughs> I will leave you and you can take care of business and visit with each other. <laughs> All okay. right. Thank you very thank much, you. Michael. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you. Great to see you all.